Good morning and welcome to our online church service. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us today. I want to invite you right there, wherever you are watching this with us this morning, to join us in a word of prayer as we begin our service. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, surely this is the day the Lord has made, and we are going to choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we remember your word where you tell us clearly that when two or three are gathered in the name of your son Jesus, the presence of the Lord will be there with us. And so, Lord, we trust for that today as we gather all across this community. We pray today that as we lift up and glorify the name of Jesus Christ, that you would come and strengthen us by the power of the Holy Spirit. May spirits be lifted up today. May strength begin to come into the very heart and soul of all of those that are participating in this service. Father, we honor you and we give you glory. We ask all of these things this morning in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And everyone said, amen. Praise God. Join us this morning as we worship the Lord.
Hallelujah. I want to read a verse of scripture before we pray. In Isaiah 55 and starting at the sixth verse. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. And he will have mercy on him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. A couple of things stick out to me as we look at this passage. One, here again, the Lord is calling his people to seek him. If ever there was a time for the church of Jesus Christ to be praying, it's now. And I want you to notice that regardless of our weakness and failure and sin, God says, forsake that. Repent, turn away from it. Just come. Come to the throne of grace. Seek me during this season and I'll give you the help that you need. But the second thing that sticks out is that God is telling us very clearly that his ways are not like our ways. In fact, he says, my ways are way beyond your understanding. That's a comfort in this season that we're living in now. I certainly don't understand why we're going through what we're going through. We're going to talk about it in just a few moments. Talk about the importance of trials and what they do. But I don't understand why everything happens the way it does. None of us do. God's ways, though, are greater and beyond our ways. Rest assured that God knows what he's doing. And so this morning, I want to invite you to join with me in prayer as we pray for our community We pray for our families, we pray for our church family, we pray for our nation, pray for those that are sick, and for those that have lost loved ones. Right there in your living room, join me in prayer. Father, we heed what your word says this morning, and we choose to humble ourselves and seek you in what is a very difficult time for all of us. Thank you that you are willing to that we should come into your presence, that we should come to this throne of grace and mercy and simply pour our hearts out to you and ask for all the things that we have need of. This morning I can't help but think, Lord, of all the differing needs throughout our body, throughout the church body. Some that are losing jobs, some that are far worse and they're losing loved ones. We pray for each and every one of our church family. Tonight, today, Lord God, we pray that you would strengthen them, that you would be the ever-present help in time of trouble, just like your word promises you to be. May you comfort those that are mourning. May you bring peace to those that feel like life is nothing but one big storm. We pray that you would bring courage and strength to the fearful heart. Lord, today we lift up those that are going through this trial and season of difficulty, but they don't know you as their Lord and Savior. I can't imagine what that must be like for them. Lord, may this season draw them to Jesus Christ. God, we pray that. We ask that in the name of Jesus Draw our loved ones who are lost. Draw them to Christ. Cause there be a, to be an awakening, a seriousness that would come into their hearts and their spirits today. That they would recognize how fragile life is. How there is no guarantee of tomorrow. How quickly things can be shaken and changed. And in that place, Lord, they would begin to pursue a firm foundation for their life. And of course, they would find Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for wayward children, wayward spouses, wayward siblings. We lift up our neighbors that are lost. We pray that you would save them. We pray for our co-workers that are lost. We pray, Lord God of heaven, that you would bring a true and genuine awakening through this storm to southeast Indiana. God, we're asking now for multitudes to be saved. Multitudes of people to be born again, 
that your kingdom would expand and grow, that the houses of God, when we're able to meet again, would be full to capacity with hungry and seeking hearts. God, and as we believe you for that, we pray that you would equip the church, strengthen us during this season. God, prepare us for those that will come and those that will seek and those that will ask for the hope and ask about the hope that is within us. Help us to have a clear and concise answer and to point them directly to Christ and to Christ alone. Lord, we pray that you'd cause the church of Jesus Christ to awake, to shine brightly during this season, that you might be glorified. Now, Father, we pray for our nation today. So much turmoil, confusion, difficult decisions. We lift up our president. God, help him, strengthen him, bless him, give him good, honest advisors that will speak truth into his ears that he would make good decisions. We lift up every senator, every congressman or woman. We pray for every one of our federal leaders that, Lord, they would have wisdom now and direction from heaven on what next to do. Lord, may that filter into the state government as well. We lift up Governor Holcomb and we pray Lord, that you would give him wisdom as he begins to make decisions on how to open the economy and open the state once again. Lord, may good men and good women, godly men and godly women rise around Governor Holcomb and give him clarity and wisdom and direction. In the midst of a multitude of counselors, Lord, your word declares there is wisdom. So may there be good counselors in his ear. We pray, Lord, for local leaders and those that are struggling even in this area. We pray that you'd give them wisdom and clarity and courage to do what's right and to do what's good. Father, we ask you again today, heal our land. I know so many, we join the prayers of so many that are praying day in and day out. We are trusting you. Lord, our eyes are upon you. We trust you today that you, Lord God of heaven, will heal our land. We honor you and we thank you this morning. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to enjoy these announcements very quickly. Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Ben. Thanks for joining us again. This is your weekly announcements. We will be holding another food pantry this coming Monday, April the 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. This will be a drive-through pantry. So again, stay in your vehicles because we have wonderful volunteers that will bring the food out to you. We just want to remind you that you guys can still give and you can do that in three different ways. You can give online or through our app. You can mail in a check or you can bring it in during our business hours. If you haven't already, go ahead and download our app. You can easily find the link in our Facebook page, in the About section, or on our website. Also, make sure you like us on Facebook so that you can keep up with the weekly content that we are putting out. You can find a complete list of that content in the description. That's all we have for you this week. If you miss anything, everything I talked about will be in the description. Again, have a great week, and we'll see you soon. All right, praise God. If you have your Bibles this morning, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read a few verses there. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to ask you, pray, pray for me, pray for your pastor. Um, I am getting so tired of just preaching to a camera. I miss you all so much. Um, I know Charlotte misses you. We can't wait until we're able to get back together. Um, and folks, we're praying and we're believing, we're trusting. Hopefully, just a few more weeks, um, we'll be coming to you with some more details with that. But uh, let's stay in prayer together. Let's trust that things are going to begin to to clear up. That this virus is going to begin to uh, just just dry up by by God's supernatural strength and ability. And uh, we'll be back together in church very very soon. So, with that said, if you're in First Peter chapter one, I want to take some time this morning to do maybe more of a teaching, less preaching, and maybe a little bit more teaching today. Um, So if you just kind of prepare for that, I want to talk about examining yourself, examining yourself. Um, 
As Paul the Apostle closes out his second letter to the Corinthian church, he ends by saying this, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Now, the apostle was, a cha was challenging the church about the genuineness of their faith. Either that or he was encouraging them to evaluate how deeply rooted in Christ they really were. And folks, I believe that right now for the church of Jesus Christ, including you and I, it is a great time that we do the exact same thing. That we evaluate ourselves. Make sure you understand that. Not others, not judging and pointing fingers and casting stones and looking at others, but rather evaluating ourselves. Because there is no better way to examine our faith than when we are going through trials. And I don't have to tell you, all of us right now are going through trials. So this morning, I want to spend a few minutes teaching about what the Bible tells us about this kind of evaluation process when it comes to trials and the testing of our faith. Let's read it together. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance in incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In this passage, we see that trials are actually used by God for the testing of our faith. Peter associates this testing with the refining of gold. Now, gold would have been the most precious commodity known to man during the time of this writing. And you refine gold by placing it in an oven, turning up the furnace or turning up the heat, melting that thing, melting that gold down, so that if there are any impurities within the elements, that those things will begin to rise to the surface so that they can be skimmed off. I want you to notice that. Verse 7 says that the same process happens when you and I are going through trials. That our faith is put in the furnace, the heat is turned up so that impurities can come to the top and be skimmed off. That's what he says in the seventh verse. That the genuineness of your faith, which is much more precious than gold, which perishes, perishes by fire, that that, the, the genuineness of your faith, may come to the surface, and to the forefront. And I believe today that's exactly what's happening to the church of Jesus Christ. It's, it's not something that you and I should resist or buck up against, but rather it's really something that we need to be embracing. I want you to, I want you to notice that the most precious thing to God is not gold, it's not material things, it's not the things of this earth or the things of this world, it's not even your giftings, your talents, your abilities. It's, it's not what you and I have in our own natural strength, but the most precious thing to God is our faith. It's our faith. It is, it is our faith that he wants to purify, that he wants to prove, and he does this through difficulties and trials. That explains why Peter associates rejoicing with suffering. The sixth verse, I've always struggled with that sixth verse. I'm not going to lie. He says, in this greatly rejoice. Like, what are you talking about? How, how do I rejoice when I'm going through the fire? And so, as I've learned over the years, I've, I've learned to realize that, that it's a strange thing to think that we would rejoice as we're going through difficulties. But, but I'm not so sure that's exactly what Peter was saying. It, it very well could be that Peter was saying, 
the reason Christians can rejoice while they're going through trials and while their faith is being tested is because they understand the process. It, it's not that the circumstances are, give us reason to rejoice because they don't. The, the circumstances are what they are. They're difficult. They're hard. In fact, he says they're grievous. That's not what we're rejoicing in. What we're rejoicing in is not what we're experiencing now, but what we are looking ahead toward in, by faith in the future. We recognize that the process that we're in now is going to bring about a stronger faith, a closer walk with Jesus, fresh revelation. We understand that through this process, things that may have been hidden in our hearts that we didn't recognize or know that were there, God is going to allow them to come to the surface so that we can deal with them rightly, get rid of them and get them out of our life. It's like the weights and the sins that so easily beset us. We're going to begin to see what those things are so that we can get them out of our life and run our race even better, more swiftly than we were before the trial. And when we begin to think of it that way, we can rejoice. Not with what's going on, not with the hardship of today, but with what we know the future holds for God's people. So before we move on to another passage of Scripture, I want to just clarify a few things. Here's what we know about trials. Four things. Trials meet needs. Trials come in different shapes and sizes. Trials are not easy. And trials are controlled by God. Let me just touch on those really quick before we move on. Trials meet needs. Even though we don't always know the need that is being met, we have to trust that God does. He knows what needs we individually need, have need of, and he knows the needs within the body of Christ, the church as a whole. He knows exactly how to deal with them. And so he will allow and permit certain trials that will deal with those specific needs. You know, at the end of the day, we just have to come to the, when we're talking about trials, we just have to come to the place where we trust God in the process. There's really no way of getting around it. This morning, as we look around at what's going on in the world and in our own personal lives, there just has to be a, but we can't explain every detail. We, we, we don't have an answer for every question as to why this is happening or why is this going this way. Why, why did we pray for some people and they were healed and why did we pray for others and they passed? We don't know. And it's, it's, this is heaviness on us. It weighs on us and it's grievous to us and it's difficult. But what we have to fall back on is our trust in an all-knowing, perfect God. He knows what he's doing. He understands what he is allowing and permitting us to go through. And so we have to trust that our trials are meeting needs. Second, trials come in all shapes and sizes. Just because you have overcome one trial in your life doesn't mean that you automatically will win all of the others. I've learned that firsthand. I'm sure you have also. I, I like what War Warren Worsby said. He said, trials are varied and God matches the trial to our strength and needs. You and I understand that God is not going to allow us to go through anything that he will not equip us and strengthen us to endure. Whatever he calls us to, he will equip us to get through. And so trials come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them, some of them are, are small, some of them are big. I think what we're going through now as a church, as a community, as a society, is a pretty big trial. One that probably many of us, we've never faced. We have, we have no understanding of. But we know that God is faithful through them all. Number three, trials are not easy. Obvious right? And so because trials are not easy, you don't have to take a careless attitude toward trials. You don't have to be like the proverbial ostrich that sticks its head into the sand and acts as if they aren't there, or the person that's fake that wears a mask and acts like everything is going great in their life. That's not reality. No, trials are difficult. They produce heaviness. They, they bring about a grievance in our heart. We are grieved. Notice, Peter says it in that verse. Though now for a little while you have been grieved by various trials. We don't take a careless attitude. We have to accept the fact 
that there, that there are difficult experiences in life. Or I just want to say it this way. Life's hard. That's the reality. Jesus said it that clearly. He said, in this life, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. In this world and in this life, there's going to be difficult things and unanswered questions and struggles that we just, we just have a hard time dealing with. That is the reality of life. We don't have to act super spiritual through the process because our hope is in a future glory. We understand the process. Hopefully, we're willing to look and examine our lives and ourselves, and we know that what we are building our lives on is solid and firm. It's not going to be shaken. It's kind of like the good fighter that is able to take a hit. You know, they have a good chin. That's what they say if, you, if you're a boxing fan or an MMA fan. You know, a fighter that, that, that's good offensively, that can punch and hit and kick and all the different things that they're able to do, but they can't take a punch, is not a very good fighter. It's the fighter that's able to stand in the battle and take a hit now and then. It's not enjoyable to take a hit, but they can take it, knowing and trusting in their skills that they're going to be able to get through that battle on the victorious side. Lastly, trials are controlled by God. Trials are for a season. Man, I want you to get that this morning. The, tri the present trial that you and I are dealing with is only for a season. This season will soon change. There's no question. When God permits his children to go through the furnace of trial and suffering and difficulty, he keeps his eye on the clock and his hand on the thermostat. I love that. You understand what he's saying? In other words, he's not going to allow you to stay in this season too long. You might think it's too long. <laughs> For me, the first few moments of the trial is too long. But God knows better. He's a good father. No, he's, he's got his eye on the clock. He knows just how long he needs for you and I to be in our particular trial. He has his hand on the thermostat. In other words, he's not going to allow what you're going through to get too hot. You will be able to endure whatever it is that God is permitting to come into your life during this season. Make no mistake. You have to understand that, and you have to trust in that. The enemy will come. Your own heart will even tell you. Your own mind will try to convince you that you're not strong enough. You're not able. It's, you're never going to make it. This is going to be the thing that kills you or destroys you. But make no mistake, that is not true. You are in the hand of God Almighty. He's watching the clock. He has his hand on the thermostat. He's not going to allow you to stay there too long, and he's not going to allow it to get too hot for you to endure. Now, just as the goldsmith tests the gold to see if it's pure or if it's counterfeit, the trials of our life and the testing of our faith does the exact same thing. It's important that during this season, we use these trials to see and evaluate ourselves to see, is our faith sincere? Or maybe another way of saying it, are our roots firmly and deeply rooted where they should be. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. I want you to get that. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. False faith, shallow roots, a faulty foundation will all be exposed while the storm rages. Now for some of you as I'm preaching this, you're coming to the reality of understanding that your roots have been shallow. That, that the foundation of your life has been a little faulty. That the truth is, you, your, 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 your roots are, are much more shallow than you believe them to be. It's okay. That's not, that's not something that we like to see. That's, that's not something, we don't like to see those imperfections in ourselves. But understand, that is the goodness and the love and the grace of God. Because he's showing you so that you can fix it, so that you can begin to make a change, so you can begin to turn to him and, and make improvements in the foundation and the root system. So that you can begin to build and develop a stronger and more viable and vital faith. We see all of these truths being preached throughout the word of God. We see it as Jesus finishes his sermon on the mount in Matthew chapter 7. 
At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he famously says this, if you hear my words and you heed them and you follow them, you will be likened unto a man who built his house on the rock. The rains came and the floods came and they beat upon that house, but the house stood firm because the house was built on the rock. He says, but if you don't embrace my word and you don't build your life on the foundation of my word, you'll be like the man that built his house on the sand. Same rain, same floods, same storm came, but this time the outcome was different. The house was overcome and the house collapsed because the foundation was on a faulty or the house was built on a faulty foundation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul addresses this issue. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 17. We won't read it this morning, but if you'd like to go back, check it out. Paul teaches us that there's only one foundation that you and I can build our lives on, that when shaking comes, it will not be shaken. And that is the foundation of Jesus Christ. He says, if you try to build with any other type of material, wood, hay, stubble, whatever it may be, there is going to be a day of trying and testing and fire and shaking. And when that day comes, your house or your building will collapse. Then again, there is the parable of the sower and the seed. That's where I want to end this morning. I want to end with us learning some important lessons from Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed. So if you'll turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. This parable is actually um, in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. But we want to we look at Mark's account, Mark chapter 4. And let's start reading together at verse 1. We'll go from verse 1 through 9, and then we'll skip over to verse 14 as Jesus gives the explanation. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. And again, he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole multitude of, was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprung up, increased, and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty and some a hundred. And he said to them, he who has an ear, to he, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's important. That's important. As, as Jesus is teaching this to the, to the crowd during his time, it was important for them. He was, he was emphasizing to them, listen to what I'm teaching you. This is important. Folks, it is important 2,000 years later for you and I. He who has ears, let him hear what the Lord speaks. Now, many of them didn't understand the parable. And so Jesus goes back with the 12. And in a private setting, the disciples ask him like, okay, what exactly were you trying to show us? And so Jesus begins to explain this parable. So we don't have to surmise what Jesus was trying to teach us. He tells us specifically what it is we need to learn about the sower and the seed. Skip with me to verse 14. The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the, are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation and persecution persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word accept it and bear fruit. Some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. 
And so Jesus begins to show us what is what, what the answer to the parable is. By the way, before we go any further, I want you to understand this. This parable probably helped the disciples understand why Jesus was not very impressed with large crowds. You know, often they would be out and large throngs of people would just gather to hear Jesus' teaching. And Jesus just seemed to be rather indifferent toward the crowds. He wasn't impressed. And this kind of baffled the disciples often, but, but I have to believe that as this parable is being taught, the disciples started to get it because Jesus realized that, that even though he was the greatest teacher ever sent to earth and he was teaching the kingdom of God, he was teaching the heart and the kingdom and the will of God, that there were going to be people within earshot, those that were listening to his teaching, who their soil was not prepared to hear what he was going to, to teach or receive and accept what he was going to be, be teaching. And so therefore, he understood and he knew that even though there is a crowd today, there may not be a crowd tomorrow because, because many of them are not going to receive what I'm saying. And when it gets difficult, when times get hard, when persecution comes, when trials arise, they're not going to be following me anyway. And Jesus understood that. It's important for the church to understand that. I have to wonder if that's not one of the lessons for us to learn as the church of Jesus Christ in America today. A church that largely has been overcome like with, with this real desire to have crowds and this um, real emphasis on numbers and the focus on kind of consumer Christianity. Now listen, I'm all for creating an environment and a church and a service where everyone is welcome. And, and I want everyone in southeast Indiana to come to the Bridge of Hope Worship Center. I do. But we cannot be overwhelmed and consumed and making that our number one goal. It must not be exclusively about numbers. It must be about getting the word, the seed, the word of God, the seed into the heart of those around us. And so Jesus explains the parable. Let's just do it really quick as we close. We see this. The seed is God's word. We know that. And the soil represents our heart. So the question really begun, begins to be that you and I need to ask ourselves in this evaluation and examining process is what kind of soil is your heart? What kind of soil um, are, are, we, are we providing for God's word? So there's four types of soil, right? There's the hard soil or the hard heart. The hard heart is the type of person who resists the word of God. Um, I'm amazed at the number of people that walk into churches who will listen to preachers only to the whole time someone's preaching, they're critical, they're indifferent, they're, they're always looking for some small mistake, some, some error in what they said. They're just kind of hard-hearted, you know? And, and, and sadly, sometimes they're in the church. There's clearly a lot of these people outside of the church where they're just cold and indifferent to the word. They're never, they're never doing what the Bible says, which is to receive the word of God with meekness. Folks, let me tell you, that is key that, that is key to our success as Christians, is receiving the word of God with a humble and meek heart. But the hard soil represents that person that's not like that. And because of that, Satan can come and just easily snatch away what's trying, what God's trying to sow into their heart. You know why? Because they're already creating a resistance. They're, they're making way for the enemy. They're making it easy for Satan. And Jesus said it was the birds, but then he refers to the birds as Satan as just coming along and just snatching that up right off the ground. I heard one person, one commentary, say it this way. Hard ground and hard soil um, develops as people tromp, trample and walk all over it. And sometimes it's the people that have been hurt. You know, they've been trampled on. They've been walked on. They've been used. Sometimes, sadly, they are the ones that create a very hard and cold and indifferent heart. Let me encourage you, if that's you, maybe you've been hurt, maybe you've been used, maybe, maybe you've been trampled on and your heart you know, feels a little hard and cold. If you'll, just, if you'll just simply begin, just with a whisper, just begin to call out to Jesus, he'll come. You know what needs to be done? It's just like the natural. If, if you begin to look over our community in the next few weeks, you're going to see that they're going to get out with disc and plows and all these different tools to get into the fields to, to plow the dirt, to to break up that fallow ground, as the scripture says, that hard ground. If you will allow the Holy Spirit, if you'll just, if you just begin to open your heart a little bit to God, 
not to church, not to religion, not to, not to preachers, but just to, to God, the God that loves you and cares for you. If you'll do that, I believe that he'll come and he'll plow that ground up so that you can properly begin to receive and see God's word the way he wants you to see it. The second soil is the shallow heart. That's found in verse 16 and 17. There's no depth. There's, there's, there's nothing there where roots can begin to develop. So whatever is planted, it doesn't last. There's, there's, there's no strong, solid root system. We, we see often that in the spring of the year, storms will come in, and the first trees to fall are the trees that have a faulty root system. Jesus said when the, sun was, when the sun comes up that this particular seed was scorched because the soil was so thin. The hot sun will kill a plant with no roots. You and I understand that. I often see this as the emotional hearer within the church, the person that's more of an emotionally led person. They accept the teaching of God's word. They're not like the hard heart or the hard soil. They'll, no, they'll receive, they'll accept the teaching of God's word, but they never make an effort to fully understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. They love, they love the pomp and the circumstance. They love the excitement, the thrill of what it means to be in church or the songs or you know, I just want to say this. I, I, I don't want to offend anyone, but I just want to say this. It's, it's the type of Christian who gets all of their theology from songs. Be careful. There are some great songs that, have, that, are, that are rooted and based on some great theology. But there are multitudes that are based on wrong concepts and wrong ideas of who God is and God's word. But the emotional hearer, the person that's just kind of shallow, they'll just accept anything, you know? And they never fully engage and find out the price that is expected to be paid if you're truly going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said it very clearly. He said, before you follow me, you should count the cost. Remember? He said, what soldier or leading soldier, lieutenant, corporal, commander, whatever... What, what leader of an army would not first look over his enemy to decide how many men he needs to defeat that other enemy? Or he said it this way, how many builders would not count the cost of a building before he begins to build a new barn? You know what he's saying to you and I is that, listen, there is a cost to serving Jesus. There is. There's going to be a cost. It's going to cost us something. Now, there's no question that the cost is not even compared to the benefit that we receive in a relationship with Jesus Christ. But the shallow person is the one who never really takes the time to focus on that and consider that. And when things get difficult, when the sun comes up and it's hot, they're simply out. The third soil is the crowded heart, verses 18 and 19. This is the person who never truly repents. This is the person who lives their life, and the reality is they've, they've got a lot of different seeds that are developing and growing in the same soil. Worldly cares, a desire for riches, a lust for things, all of those things are there, and they're all trying to grow and gather together. Now, the problem is the good seed of God's word has no room to grow. It's crowded. It says, Jesus says, this is the person that when the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things begin to develop in their heart, they choke out the word and the word becomes unfruitful. I don't know, but during this season when a lot of those things are being exposed, you know, it's, it's very difficult right now during the season in which we're living to really, you know, be focused on material things. Overly, like I, I think that's come to a halt. I think the desire for riches, we're just worried now about where, where, where our job's going to come from, where our next paycheck's going to come from. A, a lust and a drive for things, a drive for power, a prestige to be seen, to be known. Some of those things are being put on hold. And my question to you is, how are you dealing with it? Is it okay? Or are you going through withdrawals? Are you struggling? That could be an indicator that there's a lot of seed in your heart that doesn't belong there. A lot of weeds are developing. And it's time for you to tend that garden, so to speak, and get rid of those things that would choke out the word of God. The last soil is the best. It's what Jesus refers to as the good soil or the fruitful soil. 
This, of course, is the serious seeker of God. This is the person that's just honest and real, sincere in their desire to pursue a relationship with Jesus Christ. They honor and love his word. They receive it, as we said earlier, with meekness and humility. In other words, if God's word says it, I believe it. I don't understand it all. I don't know all about it. But I believe that God has sent us his word so that his word could heal us, so that his word can correct us, so that his word can reprove us. The good soil believer is the person that just recognizes that and reads his word that way. As I read the word and it begins to speak to me about necessary changes or warning signs, I receive them because I know that it is God speaking to me. They're the people who have surrendered their lives to Christ. Their roots go deep into Christ, into his word, so that when the winds of change and trial and struggle begin to blow very hard, they're firmly planted in the rock of Christ. And the Bible says, Jesus says clearly, that these are the people who bear fruit. It reminds me of what Jesus said in another place in the book of John, where he said, if you'll abide in me, I'll abide in you, and you will bear much fruit. He goes on to say, if you don't abide in me, you'll never bear fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing, and you can bear nothing. But together, if you'll abide in me, you will bear much fruit. And Jesus says, notice, it's all different. It's, we're not all, it's, it's just different. It's, it's not, not everyone has to do what you know, Billy Graham did or someone else did. It's all different levels of fruit. Some are 30-fold people, some are 60 and some 100. That's not the issue. And we shouldn't be comparing ourselves among each other. We should just be evaluating our lives and saying, is my life producing fruit? That's the evaluation. That's the test. That's the question, the examination that we should be asking ourselves. And if we're bearing fruit, we will be likened to the tree found in Psalm chapter 1. Psalm 1, as we close, Psalm 1 Verses 1 through 3. I read this on Wednesday at our Wednesday devotion. I want to read it again. It's been on my heart all week. He says this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. Listen. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall not prosper. This is God's intention for your life today. God wants you and I and his church to be like that tree planted by the rivers of water, strong and firm and vibrant and living, bearing fruit, not just for the benefit of ourselves, but bearing fruit for the benefit of others around us. I love what it says, that this tree will bring forth fruit in its season and its leaf will not wither. In other words, during dry seasons or difficult times or trial or when the sun is hot or when we're in the fire, whatever analogy you want to use, during that time, our leaf will not wither, but rather we will be sustained. We will be alive and we will be vibrant. So as I close... I just want to encourage you, church. I want to, I want to encourage you to, it's time, it's a good season to examine yourself. See where you're at. Where's your root system? How's your faith? Where's your focus? Right? Where is your real trust? It's easy during the, the times of sun shining and everything going well, and it's easy to declare, oh, my trust is in the Lord. I love God. All that. But right now, I think it's, Maybe more difficult, it's more real to test and see where we're really at. It's a great time to examine ourselves in our faith. Now listen, with that said, I want you to know everyone has moments of weakness. And I've had moments of weakness over the last six, seven weeks that I don't really want to share with you. I've had times where, you know, you just got to kind of get yourself back together. Anger, frustration, a lot of different things, right? Moments of weakness where I probably feel like a hypocrite teaching this lesson. That's not, that's, look, that's all of us. We all have moments of weakness. That's not what we're talking about. The question really becomes at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, where is your trust? Where are your roots planted? What gives you life? What gives you hope? What keeps you going? What foundation are you building your life on? 
As for me and my house, we are building our lives on the firm, unshakable foundation of Christ alone. His word sustains me. His word gives me life and hope. The joy of the Lord, even though at times it is, it is challenged, the joy of the Lord is in this side of me. Nothing of this world, none of the changes that this life brings can take that away from us. Praise be to God. This morning, I want to encourage you today. If you're there and listening at your home or wherever you are, I just want to take a moment as we close. Just a word of prayer. I want to pray with you and, and trust. I, I know this isn't necessarily something that might really excite you, but I think it's very, very necessary that as a church, we evaluate ourselves. Make no mistake, if, if, if you begin to evaluate and you realize there are breaches and weaknesses and, and difficult things in your life that you don't like, God's not condemning you. I, I'm not condemning you. We're not condemning you. It's just, it's just a good season to see, okay, it's time. God's showing it. He's allowing it to come to the surface. Just, just like that, that, that potter that works the clay, if there's a blemish, he doesn't just throw the whole thing away. He works it out. He fixes it. Yes, it might, it might take squashing that clay back down to a ball and then building it back up. Or that goldsmith with the gold, yes, if there's blemish, he knows there's blemishes. But he's, he also knows they're going to come to the surface so that they can be scraped off the top. And that's exactly what God's doing today if we'll allow him to have an honest evaluation of ourselves and we'll be honest with ourselves let's pray together really quick before we close father this morning i thank you for your word i I thank you for the comfort of your word during trials and difficulty god we're not as christians supposed to see times of trial as some strange thing this isn't strange men and women of god for thousands of years, have endured difficulties even worse than we're dealing with today. And they have put their trust and faith in you, and in so doing, they came out likened unto pure gold. Father, I pray today for all my brothers and sisters, our church family. I pray that we would take this teaching serious, that we would Embrace your word that we would honor, that we would receive it with meekness. That, Lord, as we begin to open your word throughout the days and weeks ahead, that we would invite the Holy Spirit to just come and work through this examination and evaluation process. For those that are finding glaring weaknesses, God, come. Holy Spirit, come. Strengthen them. Help them. Remind them that your mercies are new every day. And that if they'll just simply be honest and pure, if they'll be willing to repent and lay aside those things that have created those weaknesses in their faith, that today can be a brand new day, a brand new start in you, Jesus. I pray for them. I pray for those that are feeling weak. I pray that through this process, Lord God, the church of Jesus Christ would come out purified, strengthened as a pure bride, as a holy an anointed people, shining, bearing fruit, giving and bringing glory and honor to your name. Lord, help us in this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Folks, we love you. We're looking forward to seeing you very, very shortly. Have a fantastic day.